Greetings. I am Dr. Todd Lecken. I am an Associate Dean and Professor of Philosophy at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster. I'm coming to you today with a presentation for the virtual conference being sponsored by USC Lancaster's Undergraduate Research Club. And I wanna thank the students for the great job that they've done in sponsoring and organizing this virtual conference this year. And a special shout out as well to the faculty advisors of this club, Sarah Selhorst and Liz Easley, two great professors on our Lancaster campus who've done such great work in fostering a culture of scholarship and inquiry, which is so central to our identity as um, University of South Carolina students, faculty, and staff. I'm coming to you today to talk to you about disabilities and philosophy and to kind of paint for you the landscape of some of the issues that philosophers treat when they study disabilities, especially from a moral or ethical political perspective. So this is, we're just gonna wade into it and get a flavor for some of the kinds of questions and issues that arise. I'm going to not try to resolve these issues, but rather get you to think about some questions you might not have thought about before. And I'm going to approach this by a set of modules. So I'll try to make these very um, concise 10 to 15 minute presentations. And this is just part one um, for, for now. So disabilities and philosophy. I am a philosopher who works in the area of ethics and political philosophy and disabilities pose a lot of interesting questions around um, moral philosophy and political philosophy. Questions about right and wrong, good and bad, what a just society is all about. Um, so, you know, when you think of disabilities in terms of a, a sort of social and political context, issues of justice are very much um, at the forefront. So the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, passed in uh, 1990, is a, a watershed moment when many in the disabilities advocacy um, community thought that American society was getting a little bit more just, right? Maybe not perfect, but this was a definite move in the direction of justice and equal treatment for people with disabilities, long overdue. And that seems to be, you know, showcasing the way in which disabilities and justice are important uh, interconnected issues. But Philosophers also ask fundamental questions about what a good life is or what it means for human beings to achieve a state of well being, to be flourishing, to be doing well as human beings. This is an ancient kind of question that philosophers have asked since philosophy began. What is a good life for a human being? And what are the factors that prevent us from achieving our full human flourishing or potential? A common assumption, um, both in everyday life and in the philosophical tradition, is that disabilities negatively impact well being, that your life doesn't go as well as it otherwise might have if you have a physical disability like the loss of your legs, or you can't hear, or if you have a cognitive disability that um, impairs your maybe your ability to use language or reasoning. And that assumption is being challenged these days by people in the disabilities community. People who are saying, you know, when asked, and even when research is done on this question, do you feel like your life is bad or are you happy? Many report high levels of satisfaction and well-being with their life, including the fact that they have a life that involves a disability. And some would say that they would never ask that the disability be removed um, because it is such a central part of how they organize their experience and how they view themselves, their self-concept. This is a challenging view. Um, and I think we need to take seriously the perspective of people with disabilities and not just discount these reports as somehow, you know, just rationalizations of an otherwise unfortunate situation. This is also tied to um, the sense of people with disabilities that it's important to get beyond the idea that to have a disability is to be an object of pity by people who don't have that disability. 
or to be thought of as heroes for overcoming, you know, say the loss of one's legs um, and doing something like, you know, getting a job or getting a four-year degree. Um, so many, not all, but many people in the disabilities community think of these things as denigrating, as not according them with proper respect or treating them as plain equals. And that's tied to this idea that, you know, their lives are not tragic misfortunes, but just as valuable as anyone else's life. Also, um, disabilities raise interesting questions in the area of medical ethics, questions about, you know, a doctor's obligations to patients, questions about healthcare allocation, um, uh, questions about genetic screening for disabilities. There's all kinds of really vexing and um, important questions that come up when we consider disabilities in the context of the medical professions. I wanna throw out a case for your consideration that albeit it's, it's rare, it does happen from time to time, just to get you to, um, to reflect a bit on, on some of the challenges here. Imagine that you are a, a doctor who provides genetic counseling to prospective parents. Maybe you also help with fertility issues or in, uh, with reproduction generally. And through your doors one day come a deaf couple who request your help in giving birth to a deaf child. Maybe they have both, both of them have genetic deafness and they wanna maybe screen embryos to guarantee that the child that they have um, is either has or is likely to have um, deafness or some kind of severe hearing impairment. What do you do? As a medical professional there, what is your moral obligation? You know, one way to frame it would be that you ought to respect the autonomous wishes of your patients, right? That your job as a doctor is to basically honor these requests. And, you know, because these are parents talking about a prospective child, they might, you, you might say, they have the right to make these decisions and they should be respected by the medical providers who offer services to them. On the other hand, you might kind of think, wow, I, I should not participate in basically giving birth to a child with diminished quality of life. If you regard disabilities as in some way a diminishment or a harm, then you would be complicit in harming a potential child here. And of course, this gets right back to that question of whether having a disability is in fact negative on the well being of somebody's life. So I don't want to settle this question here, and I'll probably come back to it in a future moment. But I do want to frame this um, question because it really helps us to think it through. Like a, a deaf couple like this might think of their deafness as indeed so central to their identity and may even identify with the deaf community around them as a sort of subculture and say that, you know, from our point of view, um, what is wrong with promoting this subculture in the way that any subculture might have certain designs or certain ideas about what they want their children to be. So, you know, before a um, their children born into an Amish community, for example, didn't have a say in the fact that they were going to be raised Amish and to get, you know, education up to eighth grade and then uh, go to work um, with their uh, uh, Amish counterparts. So this is something to think about is deafness something analogous to a subculture? We need to step back and ask the question, what is a disability? So philosophers don't take for granted concepts that we use and we think are transparent or clear enough, right? They wanna dig deeper and ask about hidden assumptions and about borderline cases um, 
and try to really get clear on an adequate definition or indeed explanation of what a concept really means. What does it really pick out? And although it seems you know, somewhat straightforward enough to point to examples in the world and say that person has a disability and this person doesn't, when you look at the matter a little more deeply, things get a little uh, shakier. So we could try to take a stab at this by giving the Americans with Disability Act's definition, a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. So words should jump out at you here like physical or mental impairment that sort of then leads us to ask, what is an impairment, right? You, you wanna be careful that in your definition of a disability, you don't rely on a word like impairment, which is just another way of talking about a disability, right? You don't want a circular definition like that. Um, what does it mean to substantially limit a major life activity? Some disabilities are you know, conditions that manifest um, ephemerally, on and off, you know, chronic pains that come and go. Um, does substantial mean continuous, how much time? Um, that needs some clarification. And what is a major life activity? So, you know, it seems obvious when we think about it that an impairment interferes with, interferes with something like a normal biological function, but we have to look more carefully at this. You can't maybe just leave it as you've got this normal biological function, uh, which doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Therefore, you have a disability, right? Um, for example, um, if I'm infertile and never can have a child with another person, right? Uh, you, you might say by this definition, I have a disability, right? Um, because there's this normal life function that is impaired and it does seem to limit a major life activity to go back up to the ADA definition, like being a parent. But if I have no desire to be a parent, um, maybe I've never even checked into whether I am fertile or not. It seems a little odd to say that I have a disability, right? So something is missing here um, in a definition like this, or to just focus on functions and their you know, impairment. Uh, to take maybe a sillier example, but one that kind of gets at this, if I'm short and I can't reach high places in my kitchen, am I disabled? You know, there's all kinds of things I can't do if I'm really short, like maybe I can't lift um, into overhead bins on airplanes and, and gather my luggage, um, all kinds of things like that. But it seems a little odd to say that I'm disabled. What if I want to join the NBA, but I'm too short, right? I might complain that, hey, um, you know, this is a substantial um, life activity, a major life activity, and being short really limits me in this. This is what I want out of my life. But of course, it would be odd to say that I am disabled, right? So this just kind of sets the stage for going a little deeper and looking at some models of disability. And I'm going to introduce in our next talk two such common and dominant models, the medical model and the social model of disability. These are two ways that um, theorists have tried to frame the nature of disability. And we'll see that there's some pros and cons with both. But I want to thank you for joining me today. And I, I hope this has been stimulating and has given you something to think about. Until next time, take care.